I I was actually a alumni of uh, TNAU. I had done my PhD here in 2008 to 12 period, and uh, my work at that time was on soilless agriculture techniques, techno-economic evaluation of soilless culture techniques. Under the Precision Farming Development Center, some work was associated with the PFDC Center, and uh, I had done some research in that line itself. After leaving TNAU after 2012, I had guided some research in that line itself. But uh, towards 2018, when we had a very severe floods in Kerala, we had uh, shifted our research line and mostly. on disasters and related studies we are now working so that's why i was to talk to such a subject today and uh, as sir told it's not so great engineering or research i am talking i am just talking a general idea on what can be done in the situation of climate disasters in the present scenario what can be done in research or some possibilities of research that can be done in that area and uh, in that line i have planned the slides so it will go through climate change briefly and go to the disasters and their management in general and what is the research paradigm connected to research uh, connected to disasters caused by climate change so this will be the structure of the presentation little on climate change and induced climate change induced disasters and their management and uh, specifically little on ecosystem based disaster risk reduction drr and how you can mainstream this drr and cca into developmental activities so somewhat like a policy oriented paper not uh, engineering in it uh, some strategies that you, you can adopt in river basin level for managing disasters and what are the research possibilities in this line what we are doing in kerala and that way some examples are also put finally so i hope not to take much of your time and let me pass on to my slides i know climate change is not something that should be introduced to you we are all always talking about climate change nowadays and it is a phenomena that is uh, encompassing the whole globe and it is a serious threat to the entire globe and we tell that it is caused by human activities either human or man made activities or some natural phenomena that is causing climate change there are a lot of definitions by different agencies but all say that it is something caused by either human activities man made is or some natural hydrological reasons or meteorological reasons that is causing a change in the climate we generally see that there is some variability in climate natural variability in climate over the years man expects a variability meteorologically every year we know there is some variation we do that uh, it may shift a little from the expected period the climate may shift or we may not get the uh, summer as and when we expect it we may get rains in an unexpected period that is a natural phenomena that we were expecting but towards uh, this 20th century and even before we have started to see that there is a drastic shift in climate and there is uh, increase of extreme events like floods droughts landslides and such other phenomena which is very much different from the way the pattern of climate change that we expected especially in a state like kerala where we were expecting that we were thinking that we are in a god's own country where there is no much vagaries of climate extremes of climate now we are experiencing lot of change in the times of when monsoon starts when summer starts and we are also facing extremes that is not the case with kerala alone every country every state is facing this situation over the globe so that is where climate change becomes a serious threat or an environmental challenge on which we talk about nowadays and uh, causes are generally said as human made or man made activities like emission of greenhouse gases in a, and uh, carbon footprints lot of carbon dioxide emitted to the atmosphere and uh, more solar radiation being trapped and the global warming in the change in the or shift to the climatic events and uh, it is anyway it is a real phenomena that is happening and human activities may be the reason one reason for the pollution of the atmosphere and as such the change in climate 
now what are the, uh, the causes we already know the indirect reasons may be the deforestation the sort of type of agricultural practices that we follow nowadays the excessive use of transport facilities the development in a nutshell what you say it may be the reason of uh, the cause of developmental activities happening nowadays we as in my case i was i'm a citizen from 1960s and i saw all the changes throughout the period up to now we are seeing the changes what are happening in the world and we have come to a different era but when compared to you people you are younger than me and you might not you might have come to a development developed t specific world but we have seen lot of changes in the uh, developments throughout the years from 1960s to 2000 so that changes have caused lot of reasons for a shift in the nature shift in the hydrology shift in the climate and even the weather conditions immediate uh, nearby next day weather that was, that is also changing so the causes are uh, mostly the indirectly related to the development and the effects coming are increase in extremes of climate like you see very high rise in the global temperature very high rise in the precipitation intensity and the variation in the duration of precipitation and very high rise of sea level throughout the globe and degradation of all ecosystems land degradation loss of biodiversity all these are the Uh, immediate effects that are seen in the globe and what are the social impacts of climate change there is lot of displacement to human beings we are displaced from the livelihoods to other places you see lot of displacement has happened in our state kerala during the last flood in 2018 people have been displaced totally from their livelihood there is total displacement of livelihood lot of hunger poverty and all have come and we have seen lot of other uh, disasters in relation to climate also so these are some of the social impacts of climate change and this is just a graph to show the variation of uh, emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from 1990s to 2015 you see a steady increase of uh, emission of carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide and hydrofluorocarbons and all other gases that are undesirable to the atmosphere you see a very steady increase up to 2000 and uh, even there are predictions beyond that of the level of emissions that have come up to 2023 and this is another graph showing the variation of global climate average climate of 19th century is in the zero level and uh, what is the variation coming over the years for the global average temperature much less values than the average in 1880 to about 1940 and beyond that you see a steady increase of temperature it has gone up to about 2000 it has uh, steadily increased the global climate or uh, global temperature and you see another map showing the global average surface temperature in 2023 and it is said that 2023 was the wo- world's warmest year on record and when you compare the scale below the values the difference from 1991 to 2000, 2020 average it is showing all uh, uh, darker color the tint of brownish color going from 0 to 5 values all are increasing and negative values are coming in blue you see over the globe only very few patches are having the blue color there is a difference from average is low in only very few areas in arctic regions or polar regions and all other places having a very high temperature above the 19th century average and you also see the yearly temperatures compared to 20th century average in a scale below in the graph below there also you see that 2023 has a and uh, according to novas report in 2023 the climate change that variation of temperature is increasing at a rate of 0.06 degree celsius per decade since 1850 and that increase is also that rate of increase is also increasing to about 3 times beyond 1990s and that rate has also increased three times so the uh, variations are coming and that rate of rise is also very very so that is the effect of climate change seen in the 
data already published in the websites and uh, coming to india india is going warmer and warmer and you see the northern and western part of india is having a very uh, high rise of temperature mean annual temperature change from 1850 to 19 not not there is a high variation up to 2 degree and uh, you see kerala is coming in that color range also and that is alarming for me as we understand that we are also facing a lot warming in the climate and compared to north west and some part of e northeast also is having very high values and coming to precipitation mean annual precipitation also you see that the same patches in india is having very high rise in precipitation though kerala is in a moderate level and there are uh, areas which have a lesser values also in the towards northeast but this is a uh, overall picture what is happening in the globe and uh, this is a uh, the rise in sea level it is also steady increase from 1980 to 2000 to from 1880 to 2020 there is a steady increase of uh, sea level and that is also seen in the globe you see the sea level change the entire globe is in that blue color range with a steady increase of uh, sea levels so that also is an alarming situation which may lead to floods and a lot of other disasters in and coming to the rise of sea level india that has also shows the variations about 8.5 cm rise is there along the indian coast in the past 50 years and or the values are shown for different ports of india everywhere you see a rise in sea level and sea levels along indian coast rise at a faster rate than the global rise it is shown that uh, the rises at a faster rate by the wmo report and the rise rate is also increasing as i told about temperature the rate of rise is also increasing from the 19th century onwards so there is a rise and the rate of rise is itself is increasing this is all just to show a picture of what is happening in the variation in climate over the globe over the past few years past uh, few decades and uh, it is a real phenomena that what we say climate change is already happening and you have also projected that of climate change you might have done some research you might have done some seminars on climate change you might have seen some lot of papers where data projections are there for what is going to happen in 2050 and 2100 etc we see that the global mean surface temperature can project uh, is projected to increase up to 5.8 degree by 2100 and uh, the sea level is also projected to increase to nearly 0.08 meter by uh, the coming centuries so that is a projected value but what is the problem in the studies on climate change all our projections are very coarse on a coarser scale but we are projecting the data of present or uh, earlier years to a uh, very very future uh, very distant future period so that 2050 2100 and all you are predicting but you don't have predictions very near to the future what is happening in the next month what is happening in the next week that sort of predictions in climate are not available most of the predictions are going in a coarser scale towards a distant uh, decade so that way we cannot predict what is the disaster that is going to happen in the we cannot predict what is going to happen tomorrow or day after so that sort of predictions or that sort of uh, provisions are not there in our climatic projections as of now it's on a coarser level and uh, it will be predicting average climatic conditions and we cannot predict extreme events happening for example what we saw in kerala in 2018 was a uh, regular monsoon in uh, from june july and uh, an even lesser monsoon in june july and coming to august 15 to 18 two three days the rain was so high that the return period of that rain might have been 500 years 200 years like that that much high value of rain overnight happened and all the dams which were already full and had to be opened up shutters had to be opened out and there was lot of debates on what was the reason for that that disaster to happen was it a dam failure dam operation failure or was it a failure of other systems prediction systems so not, nobody could help anywhere that way uh, 
very serious disaster happened in kerala just because we don't have any provisions to predict what is going to happen tomorrow or the next day that sort of a uh, disaster you you can expect with the sort of climate change that is happening now we generally talk about climate change in a long term perspective but we are not talking about very immediate and short term perspectives and that causes a lot of disasters related to climate change and there is increase of floods increase of droughts also the contrast also is coming and there is increase of flood related other incidents like landslides erosion and uh, landslide has come very common in kerala now i i am talking mostly on kerala terms but you had also some floods in chennai uh, tamil nadu also some unexpected floods and related disasters some cloud bursts in the northeast and uh, that causing a severe flood so that sort of things which uh, usually increase a community's vulnerability to disaster what's happening is a community's vulnerability to these disasters is getting affected the people are getting displaced and they are uh, left with no uh, solutions and uh, all these disasters are being multiplied by developments immediately after a disaster there will be a lot of relief and response activities which itself will cause some developmental activities lead later on to disasters again so there is a problem of uh, lack of studies on what is happening in the livelihoods what is the vulnerability of the people with these disasters so that uh, impacts hit the poor the hardest the poor people are most affected others may survive but the poor people are getting more and more deteriorated in their livelihoods and they are displaced from their life become uh, stranded out out of their livelihoods so that is uh, even the governments are perplexed on what to do what is the measure to be taken so that sort of a uh, event happens because we don't know ha- don't have any provisions to predict what is ha- going to happen in the immediate future so there is a need to have such predictions and there is a need to have such studies on immediate future climate predictions that is one idea i would like to say and uh, what is uh, the vulnerability of a study about the vulnerability of a society on a disaster that should be analyzed on different terms like social economic environmental and even cultural or physical terms because you should uh, study the vulnerability on different aspects for which you should have a stakeholder tendency and you should have resource mapping of the area and you should also have a livelihood analysis vulnerability analysis as a study if you are doing for a landslide or flood it should be in a social environmental and cultural also physical terms where what all structures are vulnerable to the loss what is the type of society which is vulnerable what is the class of society who is vulnerable so poor how how much percentage of the society is vulnerable like that you have to study the vulnerability and only after studying the hazard susceptibility and vulnerability you can assess the risk of a uh, assessment can be done for any hazard uh, related studies and uh, with that vulnerability assessment only you can uh, save the people uh, with predictions on what will happen or what you can make an expectation on what is to be done to save the people so that has to be done in all levels internationally nationally or even in local levels such studies are required quality analysis for hazards and uh, all the ecosystem settlements the health of people the food uh, provisions all should come in that study so it is a total uh, study of the ecosystem and that way only we can help the governments in policy making so it is all some policy issue i am not talking any detail engineering it's some policy issue which is uh, coming in the studies of vulnerability if you study a hazard vulnerability it should come it should cover all these aspects so coming to different uh, definitions of disasters we have been talking about disaster up to now i have taken two three definitions for disaster definitions tell what is a disaster it is something which affects the life uh, all the uh, health everything and uh, all the uh, facilities of a community at the same time it is specific that the disaster is defined as it is something which will ask people from outside 
community to assist the affected people. You cannot call a disaster a disaster unless people cannot revive from on their own from that. They cannot rehabilitate on their own. People from outside have to help them. Some community from outside have to interfere and to rehabilitate the people. So there should be relief from outside. Then only we call that type of a event as a disaster. That is uh, according to all the definitions of disasters. It is said like that. And you have uh, different types of disasters, natural disasters like floods, droughts and all coming under meteorological or topographical uh, drought, uh, hazards can be landslide, erosion and such hazards and environmental hazards also are there, a lot of uh, related to environment, pollution and all. And uh, man-made hazards other than these natural hazards are technological, some accidental uh, hazards that happen in industries, some security lapses and such hazards are also there. But when we talk about climate change and uh, this, we are talking about natural hazards. And what is the vulnerability of our country to hazards? We'll see just some statistics on what is the vulnerability of a country. About 68% of our land is vulnerable to drought. About 57% uh, of, of land is vulnerable to earthquakes, out of which 12% is vulnerable to severe earthquakes. And 12% of our land in India floods, and 8% is vulnerable to cyclones. And apart from these natural disasters, there are a lot many other industrial cities which are subjected to industrial hazards also. And uh, these are some few major disasters which can call actual disasters that had happened in India. I have uh, put the floods, uh, tsunami, Kerala floods, cyclones, and even the COVID high had put it there as a hazard, but it's not a man-made or it cannot be called as a disaster because uh, it, no one could save anyone. I told the disastrous people from outside community can help to revive or rehabilitate an affected community. But COVID was totally different. We No one could help anybody. Everyone was shut down, so no one could help anybody. We cannot classify it in a major disaster, but it was something we experienced in 2020. That's why I put it there. So uh, traditionally, the disaster management is done in, uh, it has a pre-disaster reduction phase and a post disaster recovery phase. When a disaster happens, we do usually some rescue and relief operations and we do some rehabilitation and reconstruction of all uh, dilapidated structures. And finally, we do some prevention measures, which we again uh, help in mitigation. What is mitigation? Mitigation is some activity which will reduce the effect of disaster. Uh, reconstruction or anything, any activity which will help to reduce the uh, great uh, deep or uh, very dense effects of disaster mm. so something with that help to support that is mitigation and uh, making the people prepare giving early warning so all these prevention mitigation preparedness and early warning comes as a pre-disaster phase before a disaster you can do all these things prevention mitigation preparing people also giving a warning that is going to happen that is all in the pre-disaster phase. But in the post-disaster phase, usually we do relief recovery and uh, giving some grants and all those things and rehabilitating and reconstructing the land. And development all comes in this phase. But these developments itself can lead to, again, to disasters in a future year. That is the traditional cycle of disaster management. And uh, this is just showing the example of what are the preparedness programs, what are the response activities, what are the recovery mitigation measures that you do. This is like a cycle that once it happens, of relief, recovery, and the prepared uh, grants and all, it all goes to some development, which again goes to another disaster. It is just a traditional disaster management cycle. So what I say that we should switch over from this type of management for disasters. We should um, do it in a more community level to the upper level. That way we have to plan the disaster management so that the developmental activities should all cover the thought of climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. That was the idea. That was a traditional way in which we manage disasters. 
and there are a lot of nodal agencies for disaster management in our country when floods and droughts and all come it will be the ministry of water resources and the central water commission who interfere on the data analysis and all those things and uh, when cyclone earthquakes and all come it will be the uh, meteorological department and for epidemics like covid and all the ministry of health and family welfare was interfering and uh, chemical disasters ministry of environment and forest and industrial disasters ministry of labor then rail and road accidents and uh, air accidents and all ministry of railways ministry of civil aviation and uh, fire like things ministry of home affairs there are nuclear incidents which may happen as a disaster for which department of atomic energy and for mine like disasters mine lot of uh, disasters happen in mines department of mine there are nodal agencies who manage these disasters in our country they there is a traditional way in which disasters are managed and there are new directions now after the floods and all there are some new directions in disaster management there is a national disaster management authority have been formed in india under the chairmanship of our prime minister and this same authority has been formed in different states also we in kerala have has a kerala state disaster management authority which is working in the state headquarters at trivandrum all every state has a disaster management authority they have collected the data of what who is affected we get some data for research from them the we in kerala get from ksdma and similar for every disaster management authority even coming to the levels of local panchayats Uh, local self government departments there is a wing for disaster management in every collectorate there is there is an office for disaster management authority which will be giving you some data of that particular district that way you will know you, for your researches in this field you will know more data what has happened you need some previous data to proceed with any research in disasters so for that you have some agencies now uh, can we 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 can say that there is some positive result when there is some management in disaster some type of agency acting uh? one example is a cyclone that hit the coastal belt of bangladesh in 1970 with a speed of 223 km per hour at that time about 5 lakh people died there was a cyclone uh, preparedness program after that and uh, coming to 1991 a uh, still higher wind speed cyclone killed only 138000 people in bangladesh there was a preparedness program after the first incident and in may 1994 a similar cyclone of still more higher speed of wind had uh, caused only 127 people to lose their lives because of the disaster preparedness and in may 1997 a uh, still a uh, similar cyclone has reduced the number of people who succumbed to that disaster still lesser so that way there is an effect for such preparedness programs that is happening already after a disaster so we have a uh, lot of interventions which we can do structural or non structural structural measures you know dam construction of dams and all we say initially we could have done uh, earlier years but now uh, lot of uh, da- even with dams in systems river basins there are floods and that is all a different story due to climate change and uh, any other uh, structural intervention that we do in agriculture sector water conservation sector soil conservation sector all of that can be said as structural interventions and non structural interventions i wanted to stress is on eco drr that is ecosystem based disaster risk reduction how can it be done we know that we have already gone through that in soil conservation so what is an ecosystem you call every, you talk every, every time about ecosystems so it is a combination or a complex of plants and animals and all of the living communities that are interacting with each other in a, as a functional unit you know uh, associated to some lakes there is an ecosystem of particular species of uh, plants or particular species of animals or uh, reptiles or anything that way also there will be some ecosystems developed associated to reverse uh, many structures will have when you do some damage to that area that ecosystem will totally be affected so that we uh, ecosystems are uh, one part of that ecosystem is also human beings of living and non living environments which are coming under the ecosystem 
so this ecosystem has lot of benefits that it can in it can aid in hazard mitigation it can provide livelihood for many many uh, plants or animals and it can lead to poverty reduction and uh, disaster recovery lot of carbon sequestration that is taking up of lot of emitted carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that is done by many ecosystems which are uh, associated with rivers and all lot of uh, carbon will be taken up so that will cause a reduction in atmospheric pollution and global warming and lot of benefits like climate change adaptation and biodiversity are also there for ecosystem so there is a need to maintain the ecosystems for disaster risk reduction we do lot of preparedness programs and relief activities but we forget about maintaining our ecosystems so what i meant wanted to convey is we have to be uh, mo give more stress to maintenance of the existing ecosystems so that they form a part of disaster preparedness or so what is ecosystem based disaster risk reduction we can depend on ecosystem to reduce disasters one uh, typical example is uh, the flood like flood can be mitigated by the number of events of floods have increased by the uh, by the this uh, by the removal of wetlands like forests and mangroves that sort of a deterioration of ecosystem like forest deforestation mangroves are uh, not there now lot of wetlands have been uh, occupied by inhabitation and all that reduction in ecosystems have caused an increase in the extreme event event number number of events have increased in all the continents that is shown by the graph the number of events that have increased from up to 2000 in floods in the number of events per decade how much has increased because of the lack of loss of ecosystems that was that was collected from a millennium ecosystem assessment how ecosystems in that area were affected and how floods have been uh, increased that is a study on millennium ecosystem assessment and on the, from that only i have taken this slide so you know as soil conservation people we know vegetation stabilizes the slopes wetlands and flood plains control the floods and uh, mangroves all buffer from winds and sandstorms and all these sort of mangroves are not there nowadays are all cut and cut down and removed and all these will affect the disasters more and uh, all the eco and uh, contribute much to the post disaster needs lot of resources required after the disasters can be provided by these ecosystems ecosystem can also provide for uh, disaster management so it is also important to maintain the ecosystems and one more thing women are very important part of any ecosystem any community women have a more dependence on the natural resources of an ecosystem and women also play a role in running the family so that way women as a part of ecosystem should be made aware of disasters and how it can be women should be trained on how to manage things because even on water conservation soil conservation we say it is first the women who use this resource in the family who have be who have to be trained who have to be uh, uh, educated from the household level conservation will happen so women are a part essential part to be uh, well trained in an ecosystem and uh, you have lot of ecosystem management tools uh, and approaches running in the government level integrated coastal zone management integrated water resource management fire management protected area management community based natural resource management land use pla uh, planning and zoning for uh, proper land use planning is very important for uh, whichever land is kept for forest should be forest and uh, that way how planning is proper and how it is maintained is very important in disaster disaster reduction uh, degrading our ecosystems have uh, very much affected our sustainability so that was my point system based disaster risk reduction and uh, you have to have an adaptation to this climate change we are uh, we know that this is a phenomena that is happening in the world and we have to accept it and adapt ourselves to climate change and how what is our adaptation to climate change we have to take disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation as a synergic 
processes which have totally to be included in our development plans and policies the climate change in the context of disaster risk reduction and aimed at reducing vulnerability to climate change and securing our livelihoods all the policies of the government level actions should all take risk reduction and climate change adapt the uh, key subject uh, all the development plans or projects should aim that it won't affect the sustainability of our ecosystems or it will not lead to any further disasters it is a somewhat a policy level issue where whatever we do as development should not uh, disturb our society or ecosystems and it should not uh, cause a damage causing a later on uh, disaster so you usually the very weaker sections of the society are affected by disasters we know the poor are the people who are hit by any disaster uh, rich people may not be affected much huh? and it is the poor people who are least contributing to developments to these sort of disasters the least contribution on developing on disturbing the ecosystem will also be there from the poor livelihoods they won't cause any disturbance in the form of development to the uh, ecosystems that are contributing to our sustainability so we should uh, consider the poor what is the situation of the poor livelihoods in a country or in a village uh, from that level we should start maintaining our livelihoods and uh, restoration of our livelihoods so that any development will not cause a hindrance to their livelihoods they should be secured and they contribute much to our development so as per murphy's law we know whatever happen will happen whatever that can happen will happen uh, if there is a structure which is uh, bound to fail with uh, less, less capacity for flood containment that will definitely fail if there is an excess flow so that is whatever can happen you have to expect it so climate change is happening you can you have to expect that it will happen and you have to expect the related disasters also to happen so linking this uh, drr and cca to our developmental activities is very important you can see disaster and development has both positive and negative sides disasters can create development whereas disaster will be caused by development like, like positive and negative side is there for a disaster and development also can create disasters development can improve can uh, revive you from disaster so these both have a positive and negative real so the uh, combining or mainstreaming of disaster risk reduction ideas and climate change adaptation into our policies and strategies uh, you have to why what is mainstreaming something into development means doing development by integrating these ideas adaptation to climate change should be there and disasters should not be there the risk of disasters should be reduced both these should be the idea behind any developmental activity in our country so that way the policies have to be formulated where we engineers have a role to play that is where i come to uh, what are the research we can do and what all the results we can contribute to the development process so uh, i'll come to that so this is just to show how you can uh, you can assess whether a risk of a disaster is there when you study a landslide risk you can study how the hazard or risk of a landslide is there evaluate that risk whether you are going to accept that risk yes or no if you are accepting the risk you will have to plan for it or uh, do whatever review required to that that is going to happen if you are not accepting the risk you should think of a mitigation way and how to prepare for it and these preparedness plans have to go to the government level the policies strategies the programs the plans of development and even the projects that are coming up that is the way this is a policy matter actually uh, how you can uh, accept a risk or hazard that is coming and how you can mainstream it into the developmental activity there are uh, processes to study hazard vulnerability and risk hazard analysis you can do for any hazard and risk analysis you can do and uh, once you do this you can give that to the policy workers so that there is a risk of such a thing happening what is the extent of risk who all who are the who are vulnerable that thing goes to the development policies and projects planned in that area the area can be safeguarded from the disaster you should invest in the disaster preparedness rather than 
investing money on the relief and rehabilitation activities. Once a disaster happens, you spend a lot of money on rehabilitation. Instead of that, you should invest on the preparedness programs with a thought of climate change as well as risk. So that was uh, one idea. Now, coming to our uh, subject or uh, coming to our own field, what are the management strategies or studies we can do in water resource se sector? for river basin level flood and drought management, some possibilities of research. I thought to put this because uh, we had uh, after the Kerala floods and we had worked on disasters. What all we did also I have just put. So you are now research students. You may get some idea or you may be working in some such fields. You may get some idea that to any research in deep, but I'll just tell what are the possibilities of uh, things you can do. And one thing is integrated water resource management. Once you hear this term, you will see it is a very simple lecture term. Everywhere you hear this term, integrated water resource management. So what is the idea? Integrated water resource management is a process that promotes a coordinated development of land, water, and all the related resources. When you talk about uh, water resources, we are thinking in as an agriculture engineer, we are thinking on agriculture sector only resource from a dam is utilized or from a river is utilized for you your sake you are thinking only of uh, the utilization in agricultural field but when you plan a project it should be aiming at the application of water from a basin or river to all the uh, all the sectors which are being catered by the river industry domestic uh, navigation any other uh, recreation whatever whatever are the total utilization of the water that sort of a planning of a project should be there iwrm is a very important concept of sustainable development goals you have to attain sustainability only by an integrated water resource management perspective you cannot just think of one sector alone it should be a multi-sectoral perspective in which you do water resource planning so the principles of IWRM that is fresh water is a finite and vulnerable resource and uh, water should be uh, utilized in a participatory approach participatory way you have to utilize and manage water because the end users are the people of the community they should be also involved in your planning on whatever planning you do in water resource water should be a women as i told earlier women should be an integral part of this and uh, water is a economic good water utilization uh, expending water all this should be priced this should be uh, water should be come as uh, considered as a economic commodity that way only you can man manage the water resources so it should be an integrated approach without a sectoral debarkation all the sectors should be considered while you go for that the this figure water is related to all energy industry uh, transport navigation recreation agriculture everything all that when you study a water resource project for a river basin the water demand of the basin when you assess you are not going to assess agriculture demand alone in any of the research we do on water resources, we are not assessing the demand for agriculture alone. You assess the demand for whatever uh, aspects the dam is catering water or the command area is demanding water. Like when you do any study in a command area, you will be taking the water requirement of the entire command area, not just agriculture, all the other aspects of water demand. So that should be the approach what I'm telling in the uh, integrated water resource management. And that should be done in national level, in a river basin level, as well as in a local level. Wherever in a local area you are studying water resources, there also it should be taken in a multi-sectoral level. You cannot separate out any sector from the total. Uh, if you do a development thinking only agriculture, agriculture will flourish, things will suffer. So, all the, the things things should be put together then only that whole society will benefit by your plan or policy or your project and there are three pillars of uh, water resource management and uh, it should have uh, enable moving towards an enabling for appropriate policy and strategy and there should be some institutional framework to manage it when you propose a plan for a water resource Project, there should be some institutional framework which or some uh, bodies of the government as an institution uh, work on it so there should be a management authority to manage it also 
there should be some policy the policy should be in implemented in an institutional framework and it should be managed by some management uh, group also then only an integrated water resource management project will sustain it will lead to the sustainability of the community and what is the benefit of doing a iwrm on a river basin level why river basin is the most important sector where you have to think of water resource management river basin is the appropriate unit for integrated management all the culture is related to the river from time immemorial culture around or surrounding a river it should be the appropriate unit for integrated management there should be a triple bottom line approach from uh, very bottom level to the policy level to the government level where uh, you ban water resources from thinking of a river basin as a major unit you take any study on water resources you will usually take a basin basin level study you get data for the study you get uh, all the resources only when you take it as a river basin or at least you do in watershed level you do it as a area that contributes water to an outlet like that you take an area which is coming under a uh, boundary or that boundary can be made a big system as a river basin system approach in hydrology you might have studied in uh, a system based approach in hydrology where you take surface water as a system uh, atmospheric system and subsurface water system as a groundwater system these three systems are interlinked and they are interacting each other water from one system goes to the other that system goes to the other then that entire cycle of the hydrology is continuing so you have to take a system approach you cannot take any one system alone you can take but its interaction with the other system will be a part of your study if you are you you might have studied some uh, have seen some papers where surface water system and groundwater system are connected related groundwater basin and surface water uh, basin is totally studied there is a project in iit i think they are linking these two by a model we can do by surface water modeling by swat and groundwater modeling by a different model and you can analyze it separately mod flow and swat people are using but integrating mod flow and swat to connect what is coming from the surface system to the groundwater system that requires some coding you have to connect it but uh, iit has developed some such uh, theory i think uh, there are people who have done in kerala in Agri kerala agriculture university also separately on surface water system and groundwater system and just connected it without much coding and all you can uh, develop such projects where what is being contributed from one system to the other is also worked out hmm? so you cannot uh, separate out any system you should take a system approach total system approach and especially in a river basin level approach for all developmental projects so that is one idea uh, you can have iwrm based master plans for a basin huh? integrated water resource management based uh, master plans for a river basin that is one idea for research in this sector then another important new newly emerging field is environmental flows e flow assessments for a river basin what is e flow means the flow required to be sustained in a river system to maintain the ecosystem of the river hmm? how much flow should be maintained in a river system river to maintain its ecosystem river related ecosystem will not be maintained if the river goes dry you see most of the rivers dry in summer nowadays in kerala we see even the big, our nila uh, bharatapura we say that river is almost dry every time in the summer and uh, just before summer itself it is dry and uh, never it is running full it's not like a river now it's like a playground now so a lot of trees and shrubs are growing there and lot of sand dredging is happening and the river bed is undulated river bed is totally uh, damaged and a uh, lot of floods are caused even due to that we uh, not maintaining the river bed properly so there are there is scope to study the sand to be dredged how much sand sand auditing can be done how much sand can be taken so that the river ecosystem will not be disturbed so there is a need for 
uh, flow to be maintained in a river to maintain its ecosystem. So that is the environmental flows. When a dam is constructed, it will check the flows. So what should go to the downstream should be thought about. What is the environmental flow to be maintained should be thought about. So there are studies going on now. And uh, recently I saw about uh, training from NIT Calicut on environmental flow assessment. Now this is coming out as a very deep uh, research topic. There are a lot of methodologies for environmental flow assessment, but some methodologies are only done in India. You have a lot of other options. So foreign papers are also there on this. In Murray Darling based of Australia and all, a lot of studies are there on such aspects. You have a scope to study uh, research on what is the environmental flows to be maintained in a river basin so as to maintain its ecosystem. That is one another idea. Then another part of uh, river basin level water management is in the basin water transfer. There is a need for a judicious transfer to basins. You have an example here in Tamil Nadu on PAP, Parambikulam Elliot project, where uh, a system of dams in, under PAP, part of them are in Tamil Nadu and part of them are in Kerala. And there is a water sharing act between Kerala and Tamil Nadu. And there are a lot of disputes also in that. This agreement was signed very early and now it is past revision for so many years. So many years it has not been revised. So the waters have changed a lot. The flow has changed a lot. Climate has changed a lot. So there is a need to go into the industry uh, sharing issues between Kerala, Tamil Nadu, uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and all. That way river basin level transfer of water is possible judiciously so that flood in a basin can be transferred and stored in some other in in PAP there was a provision when the dam uh, the floods were there in Kerala there was a provision to transport some water from a basin to some other dam so that it can be saved there for a future like summer so when there is a flood you can store the water in some other uh, basin so that it will be used in the summer drought period like that judicious management of water of floods by interbasin water transfers is a good option for management then i have listed many other topics here study of climate change impact on water resources crop growth and mitigation measures for that you have you might have studied also you may be having your research topics in this line also then iwrm based master plan in a river basin level then e-flow assessment as what I have already said. Hydrogeological and geomorphological studies on river basins. That is already done by many people. Uh, geomorphology of rivers have changed a lot after floods, droughts and all. So the uh, existing morphology has changed a lot. So you can study what are the decadal changes. Decadal changes on uh, land use and uh, geomorphology. What is the land use surrounded by the basin as well as its geomorphological characters can be studied. Then water harvesting, conservation, soil conservation and all. What are the measures required after the uh, hazards in every area? Then sand transportation model studies in river, uh, river basins where sand is being dredged a lot. Sand auditing, dredging and such studies. A lot of studies are going on in water resource sector. Thing is more on water resource sector, not agriculture engineering specifically, soil conservation and all, but it is a part of our game. So we can also do research in that. Water budgeting of rivers, landslide hazard vulnerability and risk assessment, and the stops, slope stabilization measures. That is one study we are doing there, landslide hazard vulnerability and risk assessment, flood and drought assessment, and flood prone area mapping. Soil fertility changes after the floods. Uh, after a hazard like flood, what is the change in fertility of a soil? Uh, you can map it for the entire areas uh, of a country or of a state. What is the change in soil fertility, soil depth? All these changes have is, can be studied. Soil profile studies in landslide prone areas. Then reservoir dynamic flood rules, rule curve revisiting. That is also required in many places because the rule curves of dams have to be revisited in the light of climate change. Because of the original rule curves by which uh, dams are operating may, may have gone uh, wrong by now. A lot of changes have happened in the inflows due to floods and uh, climate change. So that sort of a study on what is the 
new proposal for rural curve management of uh, of reservoirs. How, when to open the shutters, what is the level of shutter open, uh, that all should be studied. Now, in this uh, climate change scenario, then you can apply artificial intelligence and such tools, machine learning techniques and all for all these. Whatever I told already, for all that, you can apply very new technologies like machine learning methods to uh, predict what is to be done in the new patterns of climate change. So crop disease and pest detection by AI tools, what is the pest infestation in an area uh, by AI tools and all. Then uh, land use, land cover change detection analysis and impact of uh, that change on flood flow. Type of a study we have also done in the uh, after the Kerala floods in Chalakudi River Basin of Kerala. The land use has changed a lot over the decade. Over two, three decades we studied. There is a lot of change in land use. Uh, much of the forests have been converted. Oh, that has affected the flood flows. That sort of studies can be done in any river basin in the light of climate change. That of Kerala floods, I'll just... Uh, this is just to show how much we, effect, we were affected in floods in Kerala. Uh, this is the storage in most of the dams in the peak time of rainfall. The landslides that have happened in Kerala in various uh, locations, the number of landslides that happened past the floods. This is a map showing the landslide locations. So some research we have done in KU after the scenario. One is landslide hazard vulnerability and risk assessment for Chalia River Basin, which is a basin very much affected by landslides during the flood seasons. So we have compared both qualitative and quantitative landslide susceptibility models, which are models for susceptibility analysis like analytical hierarchy process, weighted linear combination, weight of evidence model, such models. And uh, they were compared and uh, which model is best suiting for that base. And based on that, hazard map was prepared. A vulnerability analysis was done on all aspects of vulnerability and vulnerability map was prepared. Integrating these two maps, we can get the risk maps for the area. And that was done in LSGD level. On the village level, what is the risk areas of each village in the Chaliar Basin was done. Similar studies can go in any areas which are susceptible to floods. That was the methodology for that study. Landslide is caused by different causative factors like rain, slope, many, many factors are there. We selected 18 causative factors and uh, selected 15 out of that as the critical causative factors after doing a multi-collinearity analysis, which is also a statistical procedure to select the critical causative factors. Selected causative factors were studied, uh, taken, and landslide inventory was done. Part of the data was taken as trading data set and part was taken as validation set. So, validation and we did four models of susceptibility and selected the uh, best model and prepared the susceptibility map. Uh, hazard map was also prepared in LSG level and vulnerability map after assessing all the elements of risk. And uh, uh, finally, we made a risk map for the area, which was given for the policy makers. Uh, indicating these all panchayats are under risk for landslide, so the protection measures can be done. All the data was given, uh, all the help was given by the Disaster Management Authority in Kerala. So that was one study. Another study was the spatial mapping of flood prone areas and risk assessment for Chalakudi River Basin using HEC-HMS and HEC-RAS models. We did a run of uh, modeling by HEC-HMS model and uh, HEC used to uh, route the flood through the the flood predicted through the basin was routed through the river channel by using HECRAS mapper and uh, all the geometric properties of the river was mapped by HECRAS mapper and he using HECRAS model we could uh, predict how much flood will overflow in every area throughout the length of the river what is the depth of overflow and the velocity of flow that can come using HECRAS. That was a PhD work and uh, for Chalakudi River Basin, it was done. That was a basin severely affected by floods in 2018. 
then another uh, recent study on an mtech research was design flood estimation of parishi barrage in kannur district of kerala for effective management of floods because parishi barrage had a overflowing of flood waters during the 2018 floods so there was a question whether the design flood value of the parishi barrage is correct or not their design flood 3000 uh, cubex and uh, we had uh, we were asked to redesign the design flood value for that barrage we collected the data of historic rainfall events and uh, using uh, uh, different methods we studied the probable maximum precipitation and standard project stop sps and pmp for that catchment and uh, one method was uh, fitting the probability distributions of rainfall extreme value distributions and getting the highest uh, rainfalls of different return period also we did using a pmp atlas which is uh, published by the central water commission using the pmp atlas grid pmp and sps values are available from that we got the pmp and sps value for the particular grid under which so when all these values were collected we compared it with an is specification to select the design flood value of a an is code for designing the design flood value choosing the design flood value and this structure qualified for the standard project storm so we got the standard project value and to convert it to flood we did a unit hydrograph approach by a synthetic unit hydrograph approach because exact quantity of flow coming to the barrage location was not monitored it was an ungauged catchment beyond which there was a gauging point but up to the catchment it was ungauged so we did a A synthetic unit hydrograph approach to convert this standard project storm to the standard project flood value for which a detailed procedure is given by cwc for uh, convolution of the storm to the hydrograph unit hydrograph should be convoluted with the storm that procedure needs needs some critical sequencing of values adding up also and that procedure was done for this basin using the pmp uh, guidelines uh, given by cwc there is a flood estimation report of cwc and a pmp atlas by cwc which was used in this study that was a study on design flood value and we got about 7000 as a value compared to the 3500 cubex which was a design flood value for that structure so there is a failure chance for that structure when an excess flood flow comes so that was given to the authorities but this was a work done by the request of irrigation department and they also did and we also did and they compared our values we got exactly 7000 above mm? that was one study then that is another study was on uh, spatial mapping of the erosion prone areas of a watershed of a basin of not one basin of all the highland ecosystems of kerala that was a very big project on state plan funded project on uh, mapping the erosion prone areas of a river basin of all the highland ecosystems of kerala as different river basin level we approached and uh, the maps are all in uh, progress and we'll finally submit the report that work is going on that was a simple uh, technology of rusle and gis and uh, mapping was done some field level investigations were also done uh, collecting the cwc uh, gauging station data managed to gauge some points also no other field estimation of erosion was possible in highland areas so these are some uh, some pg and phd research in kerala which i just connected to disasters that's why so what is actually the problem in climate change perception there is no proper perception on climate change proper data predictions are not there good understanding and correlation is not there and linkages with departments and community that sort of a linkage is also lacking and appropriate action is also lacking so we should not go to the traditional disaster management principles now in the climate change scenario we should think in a different direction and uh, think of more uh, stakeholder participatory approach so that the community will be also benefited by the preparatory programs and some solutions on also i have told uh, there should be a multi stakeholder disaster risk reduction that rather than continuing the unsustainable cycle of disaster management you might have heard a term room for river water in sustainability principles uh, un sustainable development goals and all you might have heard this room for river and living with water 
in this uh, scenario when floods are coming you should have a river room for the river the river should not be river plains uh, areas should not be encroached and flood plains should not be encroached so that there should be a room for the river and you should adapt yourself to live with water that is the concept for sustainability and you should have more uh, very detailed uh, predictions of immediate future climatic conditions rather than coarser predictions to long term data uh, what is going to happen in the immediate past future should be predicted so that sort of things should be there and we should in turn uh, reduce our carbon footprints and emissions so that climate change can be managed and we should each individual thinks that i should reduce my carbon footprints then it will cause a collective effect on the community lot of foreign countries have changed from motor vehicles to cycling now in campuses at least so that way we also should think in india to reduce our carbon footprints and emissions and Uh, there should be a connection linkages between all government community ngos and all for a collective effort in disaster management and on the policy level all these issues whatever i talked about should come in making at the government level so that you can do a better management of disasters uh, in the changing climate scenario i don't think i could communicate anything very high engineering in this but i just wanted to give some policy suggestions and research suggestions so that you can work on even though you are not working here you can go in work in future in your institutions wherever you are working in the line of uh, disasters and uh, their management you are the engineers who should work for that so that way i thought to communicate a general topic instead of going specifically for machine learning ai or application of ai something like that so it is a burning issue now so i thought to talk about it in general so i hope i could communicate something useful to you with the taking your time so thank you for your patient hearing